M S W Media. Welcome to Teacher Quit Talk. I'm Miss Redacted. And I'm Mrs. Frazzled. Every week we explore the teacher exodus to find out what, if anything, could get these educators back in the classroom. We've all had our moments where we thought, what the hell am I doing here? From burnout to bureaucracy to soul-sucking stressors and creative dead ends. From recognizing when it was time to go to navigating feelings of guilt and regret afterwards, we're here to cut out the gaslighting and get real about what it means to leave teaching. We've got insights from former teachers from all over the country who have seen it all. So get ready to be disturbed. Join us on Teacher Quit talk to laugh through the pain of the U.S. education system. We'll see you there. The rule of law is not just some lawyer's turn of phrase. It is the very foundation of our democracy. The essence of the rule of law is that like cases are treated alike. That there not be one rule for Democrats and another for Republicans, one rule for the powerful, another for the powerless, one rule for the rich and another for the poor, or different rules depending upon one's race or ethnicity. To serve as Attorney General at this critical time is a calling I am honored and eager to answer. So yeah, now it's clean up on aisle 45 time. And for a long while yet, it is going to be clean up on aisle 45. Hello and welcome to clean up on aisle 45. It is Wednesday, July 13th. This is episode number 78. I'm your co-host, Allison Gill. With me as always is Andrew Torres. Woo. Thanks for having me here. (laughs) Well, you belong here, my friend. Thanks for having me here. (laughs) Oh, this is the best part of my week. (laughs) <laughs> same z's and before we go any further we want to thank our new patrons just two this week tom hale and diane fishburn thank you so much yeah thank you uh, remember you too can get a shout out by heading on over to patreon.com slash aisle 45 pod that is a i s l e four five pod and pledging as little as a buck an episode you can also get on if you give you know you can't afford a buck i get it uh get onto itunes Look us up and uh, give us a five star rating and review that that helps uh, promote the show in search engines and um, uh, and follow us over at aisle 45 pod on Twitter. So uh, that's those are the ways that you can help out. But again, best way to help out is uh, get on over to Patreon, throw us a buck. You get the ad free version of the show. You get our specials when they come out. You get our bonuses or goodies, that sort of stuff. OK. All right. Enough shilling. On with the show. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And we just finished. We're actually, I thought we would be recording before the January 6th hearing today, but we just finished the January 6th hearing. And, uh, who boy. Um, <laughs> you know, I tweeted out earlier this morning. I'm like, hey, big hearing in D.C. in an hour. Be there. We'll be wild. And uh, it did not disappoint. Uh, yeah. It, it, this is one of those, it, it you know, like watching, going to a Marvel movie, right? Like it pays to stick around through the end of the credits <laughs> yeah. uh, because, because I. Because Howard the Duck will come out and talk yeah. about witness intimidation. Uh, but I, I thought the <laughs> most, by far the biggest bombshell occurred at the end in which Liz, Liz Cheney was like, oh, and by the way, mm-hmm. not only next week are you going to hear from Pat Cipollone. Um and you and I have talked about all the reasons why that is incredibly significant. I mean, that's White House counsel. He was the the Forrest Gump of the administration as this was going down. He was there in plain view. I can't wait for that. That will be wild uh, to use the phrase of today. Uh, but also we learned that the pre- the former president that Donald Trump personally tried to call one of the January 6th committee witnesses who I very sensibly was like, I think I'll not take that call. We'll call a lawyer and we'll have my lawyer turn over all the evidence to the January 6th committee. Um, that is just, and again, we don't know the details yet, but uh, it, that could be classic 1512C or D2 witness intimidation, right? And um, yeah. Yeah. Now he didn't, apparently didn't speak to this person. Um, but you know, so that, you know, but if you know what that call me again, like that doesn't, that there are cases, right. In which, you know, the, the, the mafia Don walks across your lawn and points in the window. 
right? You don't, mm-hmm. you don't have to talk to somebody to send a message. You know, somebody, somebody sends a message like, Hey, uh, I, I think, uh, you know, but, Bob, kill the witnesses, would like to have a chat with you. Okay, well, look, like, <laughs> uh, you know, wait, let's not let's not pretend that, like, well, he could he could have a chat with you about anything. Like, like the whole point of witness intimidation statutes is you don't have to wait until afterwards to convict the person who's trying to do it. Yeah, and Stephanie Murphy came on after, and I know Liz Cheney said this, and she said, by the way, we've reported this to the Department of Justice. And Stephanie Murphy said, yes, we, we sent that information to the Department of Justice as required. Uh, and, and so, you know, how I was uh, sort of hemming and hawing last week about how I can't imagine that the intimidation toward Cassidy Hutchinson was not reported to the feds. There is not a world that exists where her lawyer or the committee or somebody didn't pick up the phone and tell the fucking law enforcement agency, the Department of Justice. And this, to me, says that they did. Yeah. And, and I, I think I love that is to me, that's sort of a segue back to all of today's hearings. Um, I get the sense and, and I don't know that either you or I are really good at putting ourselves in the mindset of sort of the average viewing public since, you know, we've been living this stuff for, for two years. Uh, but I get the sense that this hearing in particular was not really aimed at the American people. This hearing was aimed at the DOJ. And in particular, this was aimed at shoring up things that I have described as weaknesses, right? Like if you you put yourself in the position of a good faith prosecutor, right? Somebody who believes Donald Trump is a criminal, believes it is important to prosecute Donald Trump for being a criminal, but is worried, right? And in particular, and I've, I've had prosecutors tell me this, uh, is worried about, hey, man, what if I'm the one that gets Donald Trump off, <laughs> right? Like, as bad as this is, how many billion times worse is it going to be if he can run around the country? And instead of us being able to say, hey, dude, man, you're you're 0 for 63, or you're 1, technically 1 for 63 on your dumbass lawsuits, if he's able to run around the country and go, I, I was acquitted by they, I took everything they had to throw at me and a jury of my peers. You people acquitted me. Um, that's a real I, I, I want to look. All of us want to see Donald Trump in chains. Um, that That's a real point. Right. And and yeah. And I think this hearing went a long way toward shoring up some of the doubts that that prosecutors might have. What do you think? Yeah, no, I agree. And we don't have to imagine it. We lived it with the bar spinning and the three week spinning of the Mueller report. Yep. It to- they totally were able to completely tank the entire Mueller report, make declination de- uh, decisions about, uh, you know, using prosecutorial discretion about obstruction of justice that are very hard to overturn uh, and, and, and tank the entire Mueller report by doing just that. Now, fortunately, <laughs> we don't have Bill Barr or, you know, in the at main justice and we don't have Donald Trump in the presidency um, and we don't have a group of people trying to to drive it into the ground. But, yeah, I think that that does speak loudly to uh, to a lot of prosecutors who, who must already know this stuff. But we're just, you know, we're concerned about being the person to lose, um, lose the case because you get one MAGA person on that jury and uh, it, that's it. Game over. Yep. Yep. And, but, you know, I think the important message is that it's important to try. Yeah. That's the important thing. Uh, and uh, I do, I'm very interested to see, because these witness intimidation cases are so much easier and straightforward than anything else they're going after. But as we're about to discuss here in the A Block, I think Matthew Graves, the U.S. attorney at D.C., is a badass. And he is not afraid. He could have just as easily let Bannon flip and and not gone up against any of his bullshit. I think we've seen weak prosecutors that would have just allowed this, you know, allowed Bannon to cure or purge his contempt by quote unquote cooperating with the committee. So let's talk about that. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so bring us, bring us up to speed. What happened this weekend? <laughs> oh man. A uh, bombshell news broke. Uh, <laughs> And a lot of people are struggling to kind of understand it. According to news reports, letters, and emails brought to light by The Guardian and CNN, Trump inner circle aide Steve Bannon, 
who defied a congressional subpoena and is set to go to trial Monday on criminal contempt charges, told the January 6th committee he's now uh, willing to testify and he's got a, a tremendous, beautiful letter uh, from the former POTUS allowing him to do so. <laughs> now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask a, a question I already know the answer yeah. <laughs> to. Uh, but let's play this out. Let's game this out. Has he flipped? Yeah. No, obviously not. And <laughs> it, look, I, and I'm sorry to have made you have to you know, ask that, that rhetorical question. It is crazy to me. We're a week out from you and I describing the significance of Pat Cipollone, right? And those people came out of the woodwork to say, no, he's running a triple Xanatos gambit on the January 6th committee and he's going to go in and they're going to put him on and he's going to completely defend the president. And every and and, and we were like, no, no, none, none of that happens. Right. Like he's going to go talk to them behind closed doors. And if his testimony is good, then they'll put him on in public, because if he lies in public, then they can impeach him with the stuff that he said behind closed doors. And look. We're three days out from that. And the stuff he said was fucking fire, right? Yeah, like yeah. That we already saw clips from that today. And we got promised by Liz Cheney that he's going to be a public witness at the very next public J6 here. Okay. So Pat Cipollone, exactly what we told you would happen. So when we tell you the opposite is the case with Steve Bannon, maybe you'll believe us this time, right? This is a ham-handed, super obvious, last-ditch ploy, given that his criminal trial is going real, real bad, okay? <laughs> so, and again, this is real bad in the context of something that isn't a particularly serious crime. It's 2 U.S.C. 192, um... And and in fact, you know, that Allison, you did a little bit of digging on the potential range of punishment and, you know, sort of how that's viewed by prosecutors. Yeah, no, I did. I actually, uh, you know, uh, you know, Preet Bharara's podcast. He's okay. Stay tuned. Yeah, he's he knows some stuff, I guess. He's got this thing where you can ask Preet. So I asked Preet. Hey, and I was asking about Navarro, actually, mm. but this applies to Bannon as well. Yep. They're both charged. Same charge, yeah. Two misdemeanors, could failure to appear, contempt of Congress, right? The 192. And uh, I said, hey, two counts, minimum 30 days uh, sentence is, is the, the sentencing guidelines. Well, it says in the statute, minimum 30 days, maximum one year per count, right? Right. So I was like, well, does that mean minimum 60 days then? Or... Is there anything in this statute? Because as you know, some statutes say that, you know, if you're adding this statute onto another crime, these sentences have to be served consecutively and cannot be conserved, con uh, served concurrently. And so I asked, I don't see anything in the statute. I'm statute. I'm just making sure. Do these have to be served consecutively or can they be served concurrently, making the true minimum, even if they're convicted on both charges? 30 days, true minimum 30 days. And he said, yes. He said, that's judge's discretion. Um, they can be served concurrently and usually are sentenced concurrently, are they not? Yeah, that that's all exactly right. Uh, the the default in the uh, when you're when you are computing a sentencing guidelines range is that you merge the uh, offenses. You take the top line offense. You figure out the highest number for that, uh, and then uh, you know you you merge everything under it unless uh, statutes specifically require serving terms consecutively. And again, remember this is uh, the the text of two USC one ninety two basically says if you're subpoenaed by Congress as a witness and you either don't show up or you don't give them the documents this, that the subpoena asks for, that's guilty of a misdemeanor. It specifies as a misdemeanor. It's this is not a like bottom level felony. It's a misdemeanor. You're subject to a fine and you are subject. It does say like there's a serious misdemeanor. That's that's, like, you know, a jumbo shrimp kind of uh, <laughs> malapropism there. But 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 uh, you got to go to jail. But but 30 days minimum, one year maximum, um, you know, so s not a serious offense. But but when you go to prison over. <laughs> Yeah, it reminds me of uh, My Blue Heaven, right? Steve yeah. Martin as the oh. a mob witness in witness protection. And he's like, yeah, they, they booked me for a misdemeanor. And the guy goes, they don't have misdemeanors here. They only have felonies. <laughs> the funniest thing. I, I love that movie so much. Oh. If you haven't seen My Blue Heaven, check it out. So I want to talk about this bigly tremendous letter because uh, <laughs> this is amazing. Bannon claims 
that Trump has withdrawn executive privilege, which leaves him now free to testify. I'm free at last. Hooray, yeah. everyone. I always I wanted to testify. I but... did. I really, really did. And it's only been, what, 10 months. Um, he produced this letter uh, that, that says, Trump says, quote, when you first received the subpoena to testify and provide documents, I invoked executive privilege. However, I watched how unfairly you and others had been treated having to spend vast amounts of money on legal fees and all of the trauma you must be going through for the love of your country and out of respect for the office of the president. So much trauma. Therefore, if you reach an agreement on time and time and a place for your testimony, I will waive executive privilege for you, which allows you to go in and testify truthfully and fairly. Uh, this letter also goes on to decry the January 6th unselect committee. Yeah. <laughs> it calls them thugs and hacks. So, uh, yeah, it's pretty Trumpian, and it's also full of lies. Oh, yeah. No, I mean, yeah. <laughs> what a shock. It's uh, written by Trump, and, uh, you know, his pen was moving. So it's full of lies. Re remember Bannon's false and pretextual reason for not showing up in the first place and complying with the subpoena was this broad view of executive privilege that we've told you about, that, that, that the administration may be on a bigger losing streak on that claim than they are on Kraken lawsuits, right? Like it is I, I, everybody. Don McGahn tried this, right? Like everybody who has been required to participate in the process has said, no, I don't have to because executive privilege is absolute. And, and even the Supreme Court has been like, bro, you remember that whole Nixon thing? Like, no, it's not absolute. Executive privilege does not provide wide ranging immunity for anybody that's ever served the president. Nevertheless, that's the only argument they've got. OK, so uh, you withdraw executive privilege. He, he comes in. There is no reason to think that Bannon's testimony, if he ever were to go in, would be anything other than Michael Flynn, John Eastman, just saying fifth, fifth, fifth. Over, right. Like because at, at, at withdrawing the executive privilege now, right, saying, OK, you can be required to talk about all the crimes you and I talked about, then you would just say, yeah, but I'm not going to voluntarily talk about my role in crimes. And so Bannon has an incredibly easy out to say, I have testified now before the January 6th committee, given them no useful information, or let's take this not so implausible hypothetical, right? He could lie. <laughs> To the committee. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yes, that's a separate crime under 18 U.S.C. 1001. Hasn't stopped him from lying to Congress in the past. Right. And if you have any doubts about whether Steve Bannon is prepared to lie, let's go back to the bottom of that letter from Robert J. Costello. That's Bannon's lawyer that says, I want you to do uh, to the January 6th committee all of the things that you would never have let Pat Cipollone do until he proved himself. That is, quote, uh, it, the letter says that Bannon is, quote, willing to and indeed prefers to testify at your public hearing. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. But no thanks on that one. So, yeah. 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 And, and, and you know, there's there's so much <laughs> that doesn't really matter here. Right. Because. You know, a lot of people asked, well, what if Bannon does show up? I was asking before we got this filing from the Department of Justice mm -hmm. about what Bannon wanted to do. I was asking, what if he does show up before the committee, uh, before the trial? Does that purge his contempt? Does it cure his contempt? You know, and I, I'm looking at the DOJ's motion in limine filed yesterday, which notes Bannon has been charged with criminal contempt for willfully failing to produce records and appearing before testimony in compliance with a subpoena served on September 23rd, and that the criminal statute, that's 2 U.S. Code 192, is quoted uh, that, you know, this is not intended to procure compliance. It is intended to punish past non-compliance and i was like thank you for so clearly answering my question citing case law from 1970 mm -hmm. that is not what this does so whether he has fake you know privilege unicorn privilege or not or whether he shows up and lies his face off to the committee it makes no difference in this hearing and that's what the judge decided yesterday totally ripping apart every single one of his defenses out of 10 rulings he won like <laughs> half a one and it was it was beautiful to 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 hear and to follow along so now you know 
The motion also noted that Bannon still never gave them any documents. That's a that's half of your whole thing, dude. Right. You have, you have to. <laughs> well, and a hundred percent since they're served consecutively, right? Like, yeah. If you dismiss days, out the bro. non-appearance, yeah, you you still have you still have the contempt for failure to produce documents. Yeah. So I want to talk a little bit because I think Andrew, a lot of people mm-hmm. have questions and confusion. Probably not our listeners. No. Uh, the listeners that are, are listening to this program are either of our, uh, you know, Daily Beans or opening args. But a lot of people are confused between the difference between congressional uh, criminal contempt and civil contempt. Like they, people are thinking, well, why don't they just throw him in jail like they did with that McDougal lady forever? You know, and, and it's because there's there's differences in the kinds of contempt you can be found guilty of. Yeah, that's exactly right. So let's start with civil contempt. OK. That's something like when Alex Jones refused to sit for his deposition in connection with the the Sandy Hook cases, right? Um, And so the judge in Connecticut says, hey, we're a court. We don't have a private army. Uh, We don't have a legislature. So here's what we can make you do. I'm going to impose a series of fines until you actually sit for your deposition. And when you sit, that will purge that contempt the fines will stop accruing and you can petition to get some or all of the money back, which is exactly what happened. Right. So in that case, the fines are not a punishment. Court's not empowered to punish you until the jury actually convicts. Right. Um, but they are empowered to persuade you. And the only power available to them to persuade you is, uh, you know, something like fines or uh, the, the the most drastic remedy that a court can have Uh ruling against you, you know, and that was the second half. If Alex Jones had never sat for his depositions, the court said, look, I'm going to impose a series of fines on you every day for two weeks. If you don't show up after two weeks, I'm going to order you in default on this particular provision, which w- which was the provision seeking punitive damages, which would have been real, real bad. For him. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and, and, and that is the idea of procuring compliance. That's not the Bannon thing. Yep. He's just fucked, right? So this is separate criminal law. It says you broke the law on October 14th, 2021, when you didn't show up in response to the subpoena and didn't hand over documents. Yep. And as of October 18th was, was the document deadline, right? Right, right? Saying, well, I eventually showed up nine months later is like saying you're not guilty of breaking the speed limit by going 90 in a 55 because eventually you slowed down. <laughs> <laughs> so what? You, you did the thing the law said you're not allowed to do. But in practice, is this really the kind of case a prosecutor would bring before a jury? Someone who disobeyed a subpoena and then testifies, it, uh, testifies albeit untimely. It seems as though they're, they're going to in this case. Yeah. And, and you and I went back and forth on this over the weekend in terms of sort of the, the practical implications. And I love what the DOJ did, right, which was. That's why I'm saying Michael Graves is a badass. He's not it, fucking afraid to do stuff. And that pleases me. Yes. And he is. Let, let us be clear. I think all our listeners know this. Graves is the AUSA, as far as we can tell, who uh, in the D.C. office th- through whom are all of the one six cases being coordinated. Right. Yeah, he brought the seditious conspiracy charges. Yep. yep. Nine months after Sherwin tried to bring them, and Garland turned him away. Yep. Garland said, "No, I'm not bringing seditious conspiracy charges. You went on TV. You went on 60 Minutes. You fucked this whole case. I'm not bringing seditious conspiracy charges against the Oath Keepers." Nine months later, boom! Matthew Graves gets in there, buttons this up all beautifully, takes it into Garland, and says, "We do have a seditious conspiracy case." And Garland said, "Yes, sir. Go for it." That is this particular USAO, and I think. Or you know, a U.S. attorney, and I, I, that is why I have high hopes that he will make the tough calls that we were talking about earlier in the show, and not be afraid to lose if he indicts Donald Trump. You know, provided the evidence is there, which I, it is. Yeah, I, I think that's exactly right. So, so let me break down really quickly the the strategic avenue that Graves went that that kind of stepped outside of that dichotomy, right? Because because yeah, the norm, right? Normally, you well, wouldn't do this. Well, you would. That's that. I think that's fair. I think that's a fair assessment, right? Like if you had a client who failed to comply with a congressional subpoena, and uh, then was referred for criminal contempt charged under 2 USC 192 and then at some point during the process maybe not on the eve of trial like that that does tend to piss off the DOJ a lot but but at some point during the process it's like fine I give up you win I will testify 
The government would have the right. Everything you've just said was correct, right? Like the government would have the right to go forward uh, before a jury and seek a conviction under the same theory that you said, right? Like, you know, the fact that you slow down from 90 to 50 doesn't mean you weren't guilty at the time. Yeah, this, this law isn't to, to, to compel you to testify. It's yep. to punish you for not. That's it. That's yep. it. We aren't trying to get you to testify. We didn't charge you to try to get you to testify. We're charging you because we're taking you to fuck a trial. That's generally at least what the case law says, at least from what 1970 says. But, but, yeah. like... On, on a practical it. basis, right, you're going to go forward and convince a jury to convict somebody of the crime of doing a thing that they eventually did, you know, of not doing a thing that they eventually did do. That's a tough sell. And so what Graves did that was really smart was come forward with a motion in limine, right? That is to exclude certain kinds of evidence. And what they said was, we want to exclude any evidence of whether he ultimately complies <laughs> with the subpoena or not. And the right. reason is... Rule 403, right? And that is... the discussion that you and I had yeah. was, was we were like, you know what? The, why would you even bring, probably just drop the case, right? Because, but we were assuming that evidence would be allowed in. Yep. It didn't occur to me that Graves would be like, no, no, no. He wouldn't, the Kebe Matumbo it. No, 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 not so fast. <laughs> and he would like just bat that shit right out of, out of your hands and say, no, I'm going to file a motion to say that he can't bring that in as evidence. And I'm going to go forward with this charge because it's important. Yeah, no, that that is exactly right. And so rule 403 is the general catch all rule that you use in these kinds of cases to say uh, when a piece of evidence, when the probative value of that piece of evidence is outweighed by its prejudicial impact, you keep it out. And so here, what's the probative value that he eventually complied? Nothing, as you just set forth, right? And so therefore, right, any time you spend developing that is likely to be confusing or a waste of time or otherwise unfairly prejudice the jury into thinking that there's some reason not to convict you on the offense. And they won. Yeah, absolutely. The uh, the judge, uh, you know, it, it was interesting, all these back and forth filings and then, and then that scorcher Sunday night by the Department of Justice that's, you know, with that cited that case law and was like, no, and we, we, we want to disallow this into evidence. We want to disallow that into evidence. We still have our motions out there to quash the, 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 the idea of Bannon being able to subpoena Nancy Pelosi and all that, <laughs> you know, like all of this absolutely ridiculous stuff, plus the argument that they've been making forever, which is there's no media circus that wasn't created by Bannon himself. And in fact, Andrew, I'd be willing to bet that little crowd outside the courthouse on Monday was probably a Bannon flash mob. He probably texted his mom and his aunt and his cousins and said, come out to the courthouse and make it look like a media circus. That is what Empty Wheel is predicting uh, is, is probably or maybe the entire point of him getting that letter from Trump in the first place and stirring up all this news. Because all weekend, guess who was running media about Bannon? Washington Post, New York Times, CNN, The Guardian. And then he now he's going to, you know, try to argue, which which he did. Well, I need to have my trial delayed. And then, bam, ruling number 10. No, no, no. <laughs> Your trial starts Monday. We aren't going to delay this. This can be cured. Any media circus that you, sir, yourself created can be cured by voir dire. Yeah, that is exactly right. And <laughs> to to put a, a little cherry on the Sunday of <laughs> yeah. exactly what he's doing, uh, let's take a look at bannon's proposed witness list right and by the way uh almost all of this was smacked down during the hearing but but bannon again remember the only relevant question you know, the, the government is saying this is a three-day trial right steve bannon is saying well you know we've got two weeks on the calendar uh, mm. uh, uh which uh, you know that they want to portray this as as a circus here's who they have identified as these are the witnesses that we're going to call a trial and, and actually <laughs> Maybe it makes sense that we first start off with the government's list of witnesses, right? Like this yeah. is this is who you would call if you're a prosecutor in good faith. And they would say uh, three people. We're going to call Stephen Hart. OK, Special Agent Hart will testify about various statements made by the defendant and his counsel regarding the subpoena and the defendant's default. He may also testify about the subpoena returns and other records gathered in the course of the government's investigation. OK. 
Witness number two, Kristen Ammerling. Ms. Ammerling, who is the deputy staff director and general counsel of the January 6th committee, will testify about the committee's investigation, its issuance of a subpoena to the defendant, and the defendant's default. Those are the two witnesses we're definitely going to call, right? The person who sent out the subpoena and can say what it means, and the person that you told to go fuck themselves, right? <laughs> then, then there's a separate category. There's one more witness who might be called Steve, Sean Tenali. Mr. Tenali, also counsel to the committee, may testify about his communications with defendant's counsel regarding the defendant's deposition. Okay, so more in the event that you get into the weeds on, you know, how serious was he about negotiating, whatever. Three witnesses. Mm-hmm. Here's who Steve Bannon proposes to, to call. As a witness, uh, his own lawyer, Robert Costello. So that'll be fun. That'll be like those episodes of Benson where he can run back and forth from, you know, mm-hmm. cross-examining and being on the stand. Uh, so his own lawyer, uh, Benny Thompson, the chair of the committee, Doug Letter, the general counsel for the U.S. House of Representatives, Frank D'Amico, the uh, FBI special agent who was attached to the January 6th committee, Kristen Ammerling, David Buckley, the staff director of the U.S. Uh, uh, staff uh, uh, January 6th committee, Sean Tanoli, Nancy Pelosi. Why Nancy Pelosi? Who the fuck knows? They've said testimony about her role in the establishment of the select committee. By the way, that is just evidence that the court can take under advisement. Uh, you know, you can say, yeah, we all know Nancy Pelosi organized the resolution that established the January 6th committee. You do not need her testimony. But mm-hmm. And the judge already ruled this judge Nichols. Yep. Uh, ruled that the committee is legitimate. They have legitimate yep. purpose, legitimate yep. legislative purpose. He's the fourth federal judge to do so. Uh, they all he's a Trump appointee. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that. I, I'm actually going to go down that rabbit trail right now and then come back to the list of witnesses. Um, uh, uh, my favorite moment uh, during today's January 6th committee hearing was when, oh, who's the uh, who's the lawyer that has the bat on his wall? Um, oh, Hirschman? Hirschman, yeah. It's a panda. Eric Eric Hirschman, he's got the panda, but no, he also has a bat that says Oh, the justice, justice bat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. yeah. So, <laughs> yeah, I did not mean, you know, bat like Flapwing, no. That's so, what I thought you meant. I was like, enough. that's the wrong animal. Yeah, so <laughs> I could tell a bat from a panda. Um, <laughs> so, so Hirschman was talking about being at that completely bonkers meeting with Sidney Powell. And he said, and Sidney Powell just, and I, and he was like, well, I asked her, you know, if you've got all this evidence, why have you lost 60 cases in a row? And Sidney Powell just went on and on about how corrupt the judges we, we've gotten. And, and I replied, even the ones we appointed? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it, it's just such a knockdown answer. So it was yeah. great. That and when he said, who the fuck is this about Patrick Byrne? That's funny, man. I, yeah, uh, that was something. He's the All plucky right. comic relief, right? Yeah. We... <laughs> so Liz Cheney, Pete Aguilar, Jim Clyburn, Steny Hoyer, Adam Kinzinger, Zoe Lofgren, Elaine Luria, uh, Stephanie Murphy, whom you saw today, Jamie Raskin, Adam Schiff, the entire uh, January 6th committee, uh, and then Steve Bannon. So, yeah, when when you say, hey, um, Steve Bannon, uh, can you put in print that you want to turn this into a shit show? He was like, will do. Uh, and uh, and so that was their proposed witness list. So um, as as you point out, they've uh, they've lost on everything um, or or everything with an asterisk. And uh, well, yeah, but they did lose everything. Uh, the, uh, every request that Bannon had, they lost. The one thing that was a kind of a Bannon win was uh, DOJ not being able to read the entirety of the speaking indictment to the grant to the jury. Yeah, that, I mean, like. And that was a DOJ request, so that was a shoot down for the DOJ. So it's more of a DOJ loss than a ban and win. Um, but let me ask you something. Costello, um, he still doesn't know if he's going to be permitted to testify on behalf of Bannon, but he sent a letter to withdraw his counsel. Um, and the Department of Justice got a hold of his phone records and uh, email stuff. And I think they did that with the 2703 order, right, where you don't have to tell them what you're doing. And and that seems to me like because the, the Department of Justice was arguing that they weren't going to they were going to try to keep out of evidence um, that Bannon was advised by his lawyer not to show up like they couldn't that was not an argument that they could use. And they won that motion. Right. So so now Bannon is not able to argue that, well, my lawyer told me not to show up. That's not a defense. As you wouldn't 
need all of those records as the prosecutors in that case. So what was that for? So I have a th- I have a theory, Andrew. I, I can't wait to, to hear that theory. I, I want to say you, what you have said so far is abs is a hundred percent correct as a as a matter of law, and that the letter uh, that uh, Costello sent uh, to the court in this case uh, seeking to withdraw. Uh, deliberately does not is silent as to any role that Mr. Costello may have other than um, offered as a witness to testify on behalf of Steve Bannon. Right. So with that in mind, go, go ahead. There's something called title 18 U S code 1505 obstruction of Congress. It's what, it's what a lot of pundits were mistakenly thinking Donald Trump did when he sent mm-hmm. the mob to the Capitol. That that's not, it was a 1512 C two obstructing an official proceeding. But 1505 is an obstruction of Congress. It's like an obstruction of justice, but without the judicial proceeding. It's a congressional proceeding, mm-hmm. right? So if you obstruct justice like, uh, you know, uh, Trump trying to fire Mueller, right, and trying to make D- Don McGahn do it, that's uh, because he was obstructing the special counsel investigation, which is a judicial proceeding. It is a federal criminal investigation. But if... Congress is investigating something. There's such a law that you you know you aren't allowed to obstruct their stuff either. So I was like, the DOJ has to be looking into Donald's obstruction of this particular one six committee. This the, you know and their investigation. He's dangled pardons just like he did back with the Mueller investigation. He's calling witnesses, uh, etc. And so Donald never does anything for someone else just purely out of love for a friend donald never i don't believe and i can't believe andrew that donald would write a letter for steve bannon taking time out of his busy schedule when he wouldn't even write uh you know a post dated i'm your client note (laughs) for john eastman (laughs) for john eastman he went out of his way to write this letter or have somebody write this letter you know on his behalf for bannon i waive your executive privilege da 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 and everyone's like, oh, what a nice thing he did for Bannon, right? Like, he must just be doing this so that Bannon can cure his thing. No, Trump's trying to cure something. And I think it's because he's being investigated for obstruction of Congress. And here's why. First of all, they went after Costello's records and phone records and emails. And Costello advised Bannon not to to appear before the committee and defy his subpoena. That could be Costello obstructing Congress. And then we know that we had that weird Peter Navarro DOJ subpoena Mm -hmm. that came out of it. They said, hey, we need all of the communications that you had with Donald Trump with regards to your one six committee subpoena. And I, I that felt to me like they were investigating Trump, that that Navarro was not the target of that subpoena. Trump was and they were investigating him for obstructing Congress, maybe because he advised Navarro to defy his January 6th select committee subpoena or intimidated him or talked to him, talked him out of it or whatever. And so I think he wrote this letter to Bannon to cure himself of advising perhaps Bannon to, to, uh, you know, of obstructing the, the committee's invested January 6th committee's investigation with regards to Bannon. I don't know. I, 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 I just have a funny <laughs> feeling. So I, l- let me put, you know, some uh, meat on the bones of that, right? So first, let's talk about 18 U.S.C. 1505. That provides in relevant part, and you will see the similarities to 1512 C and D, which we've talked about. Whoever corruptly or by threats of force or by any threatening letter or communication. Letter? What? Yeah. Sorry. So so those are the three things, right? Like, and, and so notice, right, that adds, right, threatening letter or communication. That goes beyond uh, what qualifies, right? You have to have uh, corruptly or by threats of force for witness intimidation. So you also can have a threatening letter. If you influences, uh, if that threat or letter or communication influences, obstructs or impedes or endeavors to do so, the due and proper administration of the law under which any prop any, under which any pending proceeding is being had before any department or agency of the United States or 
the due and proper exercise of the power of inquiry under which any inquiry or investigation is being had by either house or any committee of either house. Right. Okay. So the one six committee right, shall be fined under this title in prison for not more than five years uh, or both in relevant proceedings. So the penalty for witness intimidation is 20 years. This is a less severe penalty than witness intimidation. However, it's also easier to prove, right? Mm-hmm. You you do not have to prove that there is a witness. You just have to prove that you have tried to influence, obstruct, or impede the the proper administration of the law. Okay. And that is note notice by the way that that Benny Thompson, every time he opens and closes the meetings, every time they take a recess, he cites to the law, right? That's not just lawyerly like, oh, you know, we have to read some disclaimers here. That is in recognition of this and other statutes, right? To say, here's how you are impeding the due and proper administration of the law. We have a bill that says the committee, you know, will meet and evaluate evidence. And if you get in the way of that in any way, you are guilty of an 18 USC 1505, so long as right it, it you meet the corrupt requirement uh, and either the force or threatening letter requirements. Yeah, so, and, it, and it works kind of <laughs> like regular obstruction of justice too, right? Like overt act nexus to a proceeding or a, a congressional investigation by either house or a joint uh, uh, investigation, and yep. yeah, and and so it, it works kind of it works. It's pretty much just like obstruction of justice, just with Congress. Yep. Uh, instead of the, you know, the FBI or the feds or the Department of Justice. And I can't. Again, I, I, we don't <laughs> know what the Department of Justice is doing and what they're not doing. Uh, well, we do know some of the things they're doing uh, because we've seen some, you know, subpoenas. But why in the hell would the Department of Justice subpoena Peter Navarro for his communications with Trump, Trump with regards to his January 6th committee subpoena? Uh, Unless, and if Trump weren't under investigation for trying to impede that investigation. And and I mean, there was a whole fucking thing in the Mueller investigation. There's two volumes in the Mueller report. There's all the contacts <laughs> with Russia, and then there's the investigation into obstruction. I can't believe at all that the Department of Justice does not have an obstruction investigation going on in parallel with the investigation into January 6th. I, I can't. I, I, and so now we move kind of beyond uh, like I thought that was interesting speculation, wanted to give you the backup evidence for that and the particular statute um, with respect to the broader question of is there a parallel obstruction investigation that's ongoing? I, I, I don't know how you could watch today's hearings and not come away and go, oh, yeah, yeah absolutely. Right. Like they 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 all but said so, you know, Liz Cheney all but said so in that last minute that we quoted uh, to begin the section. And again, as 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 you emphasized, right, the lesson coming out of Watergate was it's the cover up, not the crime. And that second volume of the Mueller report is what lays out the nine specific crimes, right? A, B, C, every element laid out uh, that Donald Trump committed. It was the basis for your show on that, my show on that. (laughs) Uh, You know, what we thought was going to be uh, a nine count impeachment charge uh, against the president and, uh, and and went nowhere. Uh, and all of that came from that second volume came from that that obstruction, because, yeah, once you start investigating, that's when people panic. That's when people lie. That's when people stay say stupid shit that it is incredibly easy to contradict on the record. Um, and, yeah, and, and why is Donald dangling pardons for the January 6th stuff? Why is he making phone <laughs> calls and and intimidating? Because nobody punished him for yep. his obstruction yep. in the Russia probe. If there's a pardon list, I believe I should be on it. <laughs> if the, uh, hey, about that pardon list, I want to know more about the pardon list. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I think that is an area, where again, where the uh, 1-6 committee knows way more than they're telling so yeah so uh, i think costello is actually withdrawing uh as counsel because i think he's in fucking trouble i i think maybe it's possible that he got a letter maybe donald trump got a letter saying hey you're a target for obstruction of congress because you have been telling people to defy their subpoenas and intimidating them and all this other stuff and then all of a sudden 
Costello withdraws. Trump writes a beautiful letter telling Bannon that he's no longer stopping him from uh, testifying, trying to cure shit like we don't know time is linear. And he hasn't already, <laughs> hasn't already fucked this up for himself. That's a feeling. It's just a speculation. But again, Trump never does anything out of the kind of his, of his heart for anybody else except yeah. Donald Trump. That letter was written somehow to benefit himself. I, I don't have evidence, but all I can say is that strikes me as very, very plausible. It's fun to think about. Isn't it pretty to think about? All right. Uh, we're going to take a uh, quick break. Uh, and let, we, we, I, I think we covered everything, right, with the oh, yeah, 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 and yeah, the yeah, sentencing yeah. and the everything yep. and how it ties into what we saw today on the January 6th committee. And everybody, don't forget to tune into Opening Arguments and The Daily Beans yesterday. Uh, for all the information, on the, <laughs> actually today, for all the information on, on uh, you know, our, our thoughts on the hearings. But we're going to take a quick break. We'll be right back. We actually have some cleanup stuff today. It's pretty cool. Stick around. Liz Winstead here, co-creator of The Daily Show and co-host of the Feminist Buzzkills Live pod. Well, the vaginal crossing guards on the Supreme Court have destroyed Roe v. Wade. Good news. My nonprofit abortion access front can help. On July 17th, we're hosting an activist training day called Operation Save Abortion. We're gathering experts from every area in the field of abortion justice and live streaming a series of conversations that break down the many opportunities available to you to protect access to all things reproductive care. Helping patients with travel needs, lobbying politicians, and getting into good trouble out in these streets are just a few examples that these amazing panels are going to break down and bonus connect you to the organizations in your area doing this work. So gather your friends for a watch party, then commit to becoming a defender of abortion access. I'll be there, and so should you. Operation Save Abortion, July 17th. For all the info and to register, hit up OperationSaveAbortion.com. All right, welcome back. Some cool cleanup stuff today, uh, as I teased right there before the break. Uh, Andrew, a federal judge in California has overturned a 2019 Trump administration move that gutted the Landmark Endangered Species Act. Remember, I freaked mm -hmm. out when this happened. It vacated that administration's changes and restored the protections for hundreds of species. Yeah. And so let's be clear. This move is a win for environmental and conservation groups, climate change advocates, you know, everybody listening to this show. The restoration of the protections could also be a boon for climate groups that argue that oil and gas drilling in certain areas could harm threatened wildlife uh, because the prior Trump changes uh, changed how the Fish and Wildlife Service and the and NOAA, the National Oce Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, considered whether species qualify for federal protections. So it could have significantly lengthened how long it takes for species to become protected which had the impact of taking a number of species out of consideration uh, for being endangered or threatened. Yeah, yeah. And a coalition of environmental groups, including Earth Justice and the Center for Biological Diversity and the state of California, woohoo, had sued the Biden administration to roll back the changes. Last year, the Biden administration announced it planned to review and make changes to the actions taken under former President Donald Trump. They were a little angry about the slow pace I think, you know, uh, but it did get done. Right. This is the courts is now saying this. So what what did the judge say? Yeah. In his decision, uh, this is so this is U.S. District Judge for the Northern District of California, John Tigar, uh, who said that the Biden administration has not, quote, <laughs> evinced any desire to keep the 2019 <laughs> ESA rules intact, uh, making the decision to vacate the Trump rule an easy one. <laughs> Yeah. And can we guess why Donald rolled these back in the first place? I mean, besides he, just to be a dick. Yeah. This has to do with the people that financed back, supported the Trump campaign that were his frontline appointees as soon as he got into power. And that is the oil and gas industry. <laughs> so the more that you relax environmental protections, the easier it is to uh, drill or mine uh, for fossil fuels. Uh, Boyles said that it had resounding negative impacts, both on species that were waiting to become protected, right, to, to move on to that list, and on species like threatened and endangered salmon uh, that have been impacted for years by dams on the, on the Snake River. 
That is excellent. I'm so happy about this. Um, it's something we've kind of been waiting for for a while. So I'm glad that this judge just threw it out. And I love how they're like, well, we didn't hear any noise from the Biden administration. Uh, they don't seem like they want to prevent me from throwing this out. So I'm just going to throw it out. So that's good news. Other cleanup news. Andrew, the Department of Justice is investigating alleged civil rights violations under Operation Lone Star. <laughs> Sorry. Which is, yeah. Which is a multi-billion dollar border initiative announced last year by Greg Abbott. That's according to state records obtained by ProPublica and the Texas Tribune. Uh, Tell us, what is Operation Lone Star besides, you know, a a special you can get at a steakhouse on Tuesday? Oh, I was thinking space balls, but uh, but either way, (laughs) plenty of... (laughs) Be prepared to say goodbye to your two best friends. All right. Uh, It... It is actually an incredibly stupid initiative that got nearly three billion dollars that Greg Abbott uh, said he launched to combat human and drug trafficking. And Texas has deployed more than 10,000 National Guard members and Department of Public Safety troopers to the border with Mexico and built some fencing. Thousands of immigrant men seeking to enter the country have been arrested for trespassing onto private property. Some have been kept in jail for weeks without charges being filed because, of course... Yeah, because, of course. And if you're wondering whether Abbott lied about what that money was for, uh, an investigation by the Tribune ProPublica and the Marshall Project found that in touting the operation's accomplishments, state officials included arrests with no connection to the border and statewide drug seizures. None. The news organizations also revealed that trespassing cases represented the largest share of the operation's arrests. Yeah, uh, technical violations of law, that's that's all that ever is. So uh, another investigation by the Tribune and Army Times detailed troubles with the National Guard deployment, that's a bit of an understatement, including reports of delayed payments to soldiers, a shortage of critical equipment, and poor living conditions. Previous reporting by the Army Times also traced suicides by soldiers tied to the operation. So uh, yeah, grim, grim stuff. Ugh, all right. So what is uh, now the Department of Justice is investigating? What are they looking for here? Well, this is a civil rights thing, right? Yeah. So in an internal email uh, that that surfaced in May, uh, DPS officials said that the DOJ was looking to review whether Operation Lone Star violated Title VI of the Civil Rights Act of 1964, which bars discrimination on the basis of race, color, or national origin by institutions receiving federal funding. And to that end, the DOJ has requested documents that include implementation plans, agreements with landowners, and training information uh, from the states that have supported Operation Lone Star by sending law enforcement officers and National Guard members to Texas. Yeah, and, and further, DOJ is investigating whether the state agency is subjecting people who are arrested as part of the border operation to differential and unlawful conditions of confinement based on their perceived or actual race or national origin. So a uh, couple questions for you, Andrew. Can can indictments happen out of this, or is this just one of those judicial reviews that they do, like they're doing in Uvalde? Um, and, and what does Abbott have to say about this? <laughs> well, let's uh, let's start with the with the easier question, which is Abbott's office has said that the arrests and prosecutions under the operation, quote, are fully constitutional. So, uh, you know, that 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 ends that right. Uh, nothing to see. We didn't here. ask if it was constitutional, you dumb fuck. Yeah. We asked if it violated the Civil Rights Act. I'm sorry. Yeah. Nope. That's that is exactly right. Like that's that's <laughs> that's what you answer. Right. When, when, because. No, I mean, I, I, I want to make sure you get enough credit for understanding that distinction here, right? When, when I say I something is constitutional, right, that means it is not prohibited by the text of the Constitution. And as we know, the text of the Constitution is not where you look uh, to talk about institutions that receive federal funding and or are connected to the military uh, and discrimination on the basis of hiring. You have to look to laws for that. Right. Yeah. And if violating the Civil Rights Act was unconstitutional or, or was not if, if the Civil Rights Act was unconstitutional, it would have been gutted. Yep. Exactly right. Exactly. right. Dumbasses. All right. Now, what about can they can there be crimes here or is this just a sort of a we're just coming down to check stuff out. Is this like a judicial review? I, is this a, but it says that DOJ investigation seems like it could lead to crimes. It could, there are. could be right. I mean, there, there are, you know, the. 
violating the Civil Rights Act of 1964 uh, on its face uh, does not necessarily indicate uh, that it's a criminal investigation. There more of the, a lawsuit. Uh, type yeah, thing, no, there, right? there, there are. You know, we know that that. Um, uh, DOJ has a civil enforcement division uh, and has the right to bring cases. So uh, it that may be premature. Um, we also know that the DOJ will share information and make referrals if uh, if it ascertains that there is um, a potential you know criminal uh, activity worth investigating here. We just do, don't know enough right now. No, we don't. But they've they've launched the investigation, yeah. <clears throat> and that's good. Into Operation Lone Star, just absolute, complete, and total racist waste of waste. Lone of money. Star. <laughs> oh, the Schwartz be with you. Um. All right, that's the show. Um. I can't wait to see. W- I, we're gonna. I'm assuming be talking a little bit about Bannon's trial. Uh, next week it starts Monday. We record Monday. We'll see how much information we can get by then. <laughs> Um, but you know, I can guarantee you that the the cleanup on L forty five the week later will be chock full of all kinds of cool ban and trial stuff. You can also get all of this information on a daily basis, uh, in general, without the you know really wonky nerd in depth geekery uh, on uh, opening arguments and of course the Daily Beans pod. So uh, the, Andrew, I love this show. I've been um, uh, glad that we could talk at least a little bit about. That bombshell at the end of the committee. We're going to talk about the rest of that stuff on our, our respective podcasts. But this has been great. Thank you so much. Uh, thanks, as always. Like I said, highlight of the week. And uh, it's, it's, I, I, love, I love what we're doing here and kind of continuing to break down the reasons to think that, you know, <laughs> all, of, all of society has, has not yet been tainted by the effects of the last guy. And there's still a light at the end of the tunnel. I still believe that. So. I do, too. I do, too. All right, until next week, everybody, this has been Clean Up on All 45. I'm your host, Allison Gill. And I'm Andrew Torres. We'll see you next Wednesday. We'll see you next week. <laughs> Clean Up on All 45 is written, researched, and produced by Allison Gill and Andrew Torres with editing by Molly Hockey. Our art and logo designer by Joel Reeder and Moxie Design Studios, and our music is composed and performed by Adam Orr. Clean Up on Aisle 45 is a proud member of the MSW Media Network, a collection of creator-owned podcasts dedicated to news, politics, and justice. For more information, visit mswmedia.com. Hi, I'm Harry Littman, host of Talking Feds, a roundtable that brings together prominent figures from government law and journalism for a dynamic discussion of the most important topics of the day. Each Monday, I'm joined by a slate of Fed's favorites and new voices to break down the headlines and give the insider's view of what's going on in Washington and beyond. Plus sidebars explaining important legal concepts read by your favorite celebrities. Find Talking Feds wherever you get your podcasts.